Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically, the entity. The being at the centre of Dead by Daylight's web of suffering. From the very beginning, Behaviour has always committed to Dead by Daylight having a lore explanation for basically everything. Which gets challenging when you realise how fanciful many of this game's situations are. Fear found herself asking things like, why do the killers put survivors on hooks instead of just killing them on the spot? Why are there internal combustion generators in the middle of this medieval town square? Or why hasn't our cast of trained soldiers, cops, heroes of humanity and Oscar winning actors beaten up this teenager with a small knife and taken their lunch money yet? Then congratulations, Behaviour had you in mind when writing this game's world. Most players choose to just accept it as part of the game experience. But for those who persisted with the questions, there lies one critical answer. This thing happened because, well, the Entity did it. This is the way that it is because this is the way the Entity has decreed it be done. Whenever you notice something like that, a wizard did it. I see, alright, yes. But in episode AG4... Wizard! Ah, for glaving out. Over the years, this answer has kind of become taken for granted. But today I'd like to go back to basics and ask some questions about the big spider in the sky. What is the Entity? Why does it do what it do? How does it do it? And one day, could it ever be defeated? First things first, let's get a sense of what we're dealing with here. Dead by Daylight's world is an expansive and varied multiverse, where some universes are very similar to their alternate universe counterparts, but some are radically different. This is where our survivors and killers, both licensed and original, come from. The Entity is a being that lives in the space between these universes, a space that has become known as the Realm of the Entity, and in that realm it is effectively God. Despite not having a fixed physical form in and of itself, it has created huge, quite possibly infinitely huge, amounts of physical space within the Realm of the Entity, and interacts with that space using the oily black legs or tentacles that you'd see in the Trials. When a survivor is sacrificed on a hook, the Entity reaches into the Realm to scoop them up into its embrace and devour them completely. While the Trial Grounds are pretty much the only places in the Entity's realm we regularly get to visit, there's a lot more in the realm than just these Trial Grounds. There are tons of stories from characters outside the Trials that suggest there's a lot more going on to the realm than typical DVD gameplay will have you believe. There's conventionally recognisable structures like ruined temples, decrepit castles, or most terrifyingly of all, America, that sit side by side all together with more alien vistas, like gardens full of carnivorous plants, mysterious towers with scrolls of arcane knowledge, and even steampunk airships. If you're interested in reading more about this, I can highly recommend the tomes that explore the outside the trials in the Observer sections. They're actually pretty fun reads a lot of the time. The realm, and everything in it, is made of a substance called auric particles, which the Observer stories imply are basically manifestations of conscious thought that coalesce into matter. And the entity seems to be made of these things as well. The Observer describes it as a being made of pure consciousness, that feeds on the emotions of living things to survive and grow. Without a constant supply of fresh emotions, it's implied the Entity would wither away and die. Not stated, mind you, but implied. This is where the Trials come in, rituals of slaughter in which the killers in the Entity's service hunt down survivors taken from their home worlds and made to fight for survival. To a being that feeds on emotions, a trial of four survivors being hunted down by a killer is an all-you-can-eat buffet where you can feast on a sashimi platter of fear with the sticky ribs and noodles of incredible pain and suffering and the jelly and ice cream that come with the relief of a survivor escaping with their life. This feast of emotion isn't even a survivor exclusive. The entity feeds on the emotions of the killers too, whether it be with the resentment they harbour towards other forms of life, or the sadistic glee of the hunt and the kill at hunt's end. I guess in this case it's like a crab rangoon, if the biometrical really isn't important at this point. Not too sure why, but no, I just want crab rangoons. In any case, the trial's form is effectively a self fueling engine for the entity. Survivors and killers go in, emotion pours out. And that emotion feeds the entity, which uses the resultant auric particles to construct and maintain the realm and reach into other worlds to abduct new survivors and killers to keep the emotions fresh in a never-ending cycle of carnage. That's why the killers impale survivors on their meat hooks as an offering to the entity instead of simply killing them outright. Throughout this hooking ritual, they prolong the suffering of their victims and blend it to the entity in the most decibel form, the eldritch horror version of making sure that the peas don't touch the meat or putting the juice in the entity's sippy cups so it doesn't spill everywhere. Those who survive the trial are led back to the campfire to wait in trepidation and terror until the next begins, 
and those who die are drained of their anguish and pain by the entity before being sent back in their turn, reconstituted into their physical forms to be consumed all over again. You might think that after a few deaths and respawns, death starts to lose its sting, as survivors realise that no matter what they do, they'll just end up back at that campfire and thus lose the fear of death. But with each resurrection at the entity's hands, the survivors' memories wiped of their prior experiences in the trials and are sent back to the campfire in the same state they first arrived, so that their fear can be kept fresh and bountiful for as long as the entity pleases. This particular story element has been a widely maligned one by members of the fan writing community for Dead by Daylight. Because the routine memory wipe survivors experience does substantially reduce the storytelling potential of interactions between survivors during or after the trials. Fan fiction writers absolutely love to ignore this detail, and for what it's worth, I don't blame them. Trying to write around that shit is hard as hell, so treating it as though it isn't canon makes sense. That being said, I wouldn't be comfortable seeing a full retcon of it, because its absence creates a pretty significant plot hole which would need to be addressed well, and I think the idea of barely escaping a trial with your life, and then seeing the person you just saw murdered in front of you staring back at you from across that campfire with no recollection of who you are, is a really interesting one. I don't know how that would amplify one's survivor's guilt. Do you tell this person that you left them to die while you escaped with your life? How guilty do you feel that you left them behind when they're staring right back at you over the flames? I think it's pretty elegant, but I get it if you find it to be irritating. Effectively, pressing the reset button on dead survivors to keep their fear fresh does have its limits though. And the entity demands a constant stream of new victims, because in its gluttony, the entity goes through its survivors pretty fucking quickly. Even with the memory wipe method. Every time the entity feeds off of a survivor, a little part of their soul chips away, and with it their emotions become a little duller, their sanity a little bit more fractured, and the entity's iron grasp on their psyche loosens just a little bit. As a story and the observer tones about survivors who momentarily remember all these painful deaths, memories have been through the cracks of madness that manifest as survivors in the form of hallucinations or waking nightmares, and when these start to come, it's a sign that the entity's use for them is dwindling. When a participant of the trial is no longer fit for purpose, the entity banishes them to the void, a sub-realm distinct and cut off from the realm, where the entity's broken playthings go to languish for all eternity. Those who wander this barren landscape are soulless, emotionless husks, worn down beyond feeling by an incalculably long and tortured existence at the entity's hands. These people can be found today in the stream category for League of Legends. We only know of two figures who've managed to escape the void in the past. Talbot Grimes, the man who eventually became the Blight, and Vigo, an alchemist who lived in the fog for some time, and his notebook and workshop Talbot found when he arrived in the realm. We'll talk more about them and how they escaped the void later, but for now we have our basic picture of what the Entity is. The Entity is the ultimate emotional parasite, harvesting victims from the vast multiverse and spiriting them away to the realm, a hellscape literally made of the stuff of nightmares. When there, it drains their emotions to feed its ravenous hunger, until their soul wears down to nothing and they're hurled into the void to rot. For what it's worth, inhuman monsters composed of manifested human emotion are nothing new in horror. While Jacob's Ladder blazed the trail for monsters like this on the big screen, Silent Hill is probably the definitive example of this idea, being a location that reflects the emotions, neuroses and traumas of the people who enter it. When James Sunderland designed Silent Hill for example in Silent Hill 2, his guilt over his wife's murder manifested in images of domestic violence and sexual frustration, while Heather Mason in Silent Hill 3 arrived with anxieties over growing up too fast and taking responsibilities that she didn't ask for and that she wasn't ready for, which came back to haunt her with images of womanhood, pregnancy and religious devotion to the cult that chose her as God's vessel. The entity is a few steps up from this reflecting not the psychological landscape of one person, but all the nightmares of the entire human race. Every sentient being and spirit player across every universe encumbered with the concept of fear. This is why all of the game's maps are compositions taken from places in the memories of these characters, and why generators, pallets, exit gates and whatever else exist in such anachronistic spaces. The entity has no imagination of its own, only the coalesced experiences memories of the fog's residents. As such, it doesn't know what belongs where, it doesn't know that generators don't belong in medieval villages or alien planets, and probably wouldn't care if it did. It abducts and bastardizes the memories of those it's captured because all it truly is is a reflection of us as humans, with no real identity or imagination of its own. 
it's a logical belief then that such an incomprehensibly vast and eldritch being would be functionally invulnerable in its own domain, a god in its playground of the realm with all else within utterly at its mercy. And to some degree, that is correct, but the reality is a bit more complex than that. And to fully understand the weaknesses of the entity and to ask ourselves if it could ever truly die, we need to look at the man who came closest to finding out, our former companion in the archives, the alcoholic-in-chief, The Observer. I did my own video on The Observer a little while ago, and if you're more interested in the character himself, I'd advise taking a look at it. But today we'll be focusing on his musings on the entity's nature and what we can learn from his time in the fog. For those who don't know, the Observer was a resident of the Entity's realm, who lived in his own tower outside the Entity's grasp. His tower was full of arcane artifacts and technologies, the greatest of which was a device called the Auris, that allowed him to shape the auric particles of the realm into physical objects that allowed him to travel through the memories of Fog's other residents at turning the pages of a book. He did this for multiple reasons, to pass the time, but also to understand what he could from the memories of others, to see what they knew and experienced of the Entity's involvement in their lives, and contribute in some way to a great plan that he had. Somewhere in the memories, he believed he may find the secret to the Entity's destruction. The key to the Observer's safety in the realm can be found in the Auris, which gave him the means to construct his own shelter from the monsters outside, and keep himself sustained in isolation. But not just anyone could use it, and how he was able to do so showcases some of the Entity's limitations, even in its own domain. The Observer was trained in the use of the Auris on his homeworld Terra Primus, from a universe where humanity is rather more enlightened than us mere mortals, and as a result the denizens of Terra Primus have more control and insight over the multiverse. The Observer cites something called the Trinitarian of Creation, which asserts that thought and feeling can be consciously manipulated and channeled together to create physical objects, and if done on a large enough scale, change the world materially. The Auris focuses these thoughts and emotions like a magnifying glass focusing the sun's rays, so the Observer can carve what he needs from the auric particles that build the realm up. At least for a time, they seem to be able to keep him safe. Every so often, the Entity sends killers or other monsters from the fog after him to try and flush him out, but he always fought them off, using the Auris and the occasional golf club. If there can be such a thing as a weapon against the Entity, the Auris is pretty much it. With sufficient training, a user can create defences against the Entity even on its home turf. But sadly for anybody not on Team Eldritch Nightmare Monster, the Auris has for some reason stopped working, and the Observer has disappeared. As of Tone 12, he's vanished from the story completely, and a bunch of newcomers have stumbled upon his tower, which has come to be known as the House of Arkham. But just because the Auris is broken doesn't mean that it can't be fixed or another one can't be built. So is it beyond imagination that someone else could take it up and defeat the Entity once and for all? Hell, if the Observer had the power to save himself from the Entity's predations, why couldn't he use it to actively fight back? Truth be told, I don't believe the Entity is quite that vulnerable. Despite having the power of the Auris, the Observer lived in perpetual fear of the Entity and his attempts to find a way to destroy it seemed more like desperation. The final panic of a man with nothing else in his life worth living for, and it didn't even really work. Maybe if he was given a bit more time he could do it, but the reason I'm not convinced can be found in Tome 5, Sanitas Alionis where he's at the end of his rope and attempts to commit suicide by jumping off of his tower, only to wake up in his bed as if nothing had happened. And this begs the question, why would the Entity go out of its way to save him if he was anywhere near close to actually stopping it? Napoleon said, after all, never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. And I'm pretty sure turning yourself into strawberry jam at the bottom of your tower does count as a bit of a mistake. The Entity let him keep living because it knew the Observer wasn't a real threat, because it got more value from perpetuating his emotional anguish and desperate despair than at risk by letting him keep working, let's be totally real, it let him live for fun. The Observer was the Entity's plaything, allowed him to keep his hope for as long as it could, simply because there was no reason not to. It's shown in Tome 11 that the last thing the Observer saw before going missing was a party, a collection of aberrations and horrors convening in his tower for a celebration before closing in on their erstwhile host. I think this is the Entity's final celebration of the crushing of the Observer's hope. Far from the circumspect analytical mind he used to be, the Observer at this point is unkempt, neurotic and barely able to hold himself together. His value as a fresh source of emotional pain is all but gone, and the creatures at the party finalise the fact that everything he's done has ultimately been for nothing. It is my belief that the Observer, 
drained of his sanity, optimism and will to fight back, has all but lost his soul, and thus the entity cannot feed on him anymore. If you were to ask me where the Observer is now, I guess he resides in the Void, where all the entity's other broken things have been ejected, with all his efforts to overcome the horrors of the fog ultimately coming to nothing. The Observer stories frequently use metaphor and abstraction to leave many story elements up for interpretation, but I think the Observer's failure to make a scratch of the entity's strength is a result of its nature as a reflection of humanity, specifically the frustratingly human characteristic of fear. The Observer claimed it grew stronger from worlds rich in human ignorance, but to that I'd say, what is ignorance except the fuel that stokes the fires of fear? We fear what we do not understand, we fear that of which we are ignorant. This creates a mild issue when you're trying to kill a being made of ignorance and fear. A creature of flesh and blood can be killed by destroying its body, but killing a creature made of concepts of ideas is a lot harder, especially when it's made of the collective consciousness of every human being in every universe. Killing an idea is almost impossible when everyone is, to some degree, having the same idea at once. And the Observer failed in his mission to exterminate the entity, not because it's completely impossible, but because it's so far beyond the scope of a beady alcoholic in his tower that it'd be like trying to put out a wildfire by pissing on it. The Observer said the entity's grip is more loose on more enlightened worlds like his homeworld Terra Primus because the people there are less ignorant. There's less darkness and fear to prey upon because the world and its processes is more intimately understood. If there is a way to truly weaken the entity, this is how you would do it. The mass enlightening of humanity across every world, giving them less to fear, and starving the entity of its ability to harvest new souls to feed the machine. In this hypothetical scenario, maybe the entity could die. But that sadly isn't quite how humans work, and the entity should be treated less like a creature and more like a fact of life. It reflects an aspect of us that will never truly go away, at least not until we do. For as long as those exist who choose to live in fear of the unknown before trying to understand it, for as long as people exist who will harm others simply because they can, because they feel the joy of cold-blooded cruelty or sadism, for as long as a child lies awake at night, scared of the monster under their bed, the entity will always exist. That monster under their bed will be there, and one way or another, its hunger will be sated. Well, thank god that isn't real. If evil forces that embodied the worst aspects of the human experience and inflicted suffering on untold swaths of innocent victims to sate their endless gluttony actually existed, that would really suck, wouldn't it? So, with the entity as an unavoidable fact of life, what should we be looking out for to see what lies in store for our favourite old spaghetti monster from beyond reality? Well, I can make a few recommendations for story beats that are likely to give us more information about the entity and its activities. The first being the entity caught in operation on various worlds known as the Black Veil. I'm not going to spend too long on the Black Veil as an organisation, there's enough written about them at this point for them to get their own video, and that video is in the planning stages. But I'll give you the cliff's notes. The Black Veil is a secret society of entity worshippers with immense power and resources, who frequently meddle with world affairs to make human sacrifices to the entity, bring killers or survivors into the entity's fold, or shape major events from the shadows to some unknown final agenda. They are present in the backstory of several killers and survivors so far. The twins, the Blight, Felix, Elodie, the artist, Jonah, Hadi, the Dredge, and DBD's fictionalised version of Nicolas Cage all have had direct contact with the Black Veil, or its representatives, and others such as the Doctor, Vittorio, and the Plague also have tangential or implied connections with the cult. If we're getting new entity-related storytelling from a new character's release, chances are this will involve the Black Veil doing the entity's bidding in some capacity we should keep our eyes open for more Black Veil content going forwards. The other main recurrent way that the entity manifests in stories these days is through the overlaps, tears in reality that bridge the gap between the real world and the world of the entity, typically at places that are once sites of great emotional turmoil. While normal people just write sensations such a tear can create as just bad vibes or maybe a haunting or a curse, individuals sensitive to the entity like Hadi Kaur, Michaela Reed, or Kami Namora can see or even open these overlaps and when they're disturbed, things can sometimes come through. That's where Hattie's scars come from. There's been tons of stories so far that have shown monsters from the fog or even killers like the Oni and the Trapper that have stepped through into the real world, and Hattie has fought some of them off to escape with her life before. The overlaps seem to be a pretty hot button story topic lately, and I'd be surprised if we didn't learn more about the overlaps in some of the new stories to come soon. The Black Veil and the Overlaps are the two most likely entity-related story elements to come back in the near future, 
but there's a lot that we could and should keep an eye out for. The behaviour seems to have intentionally left available for a comeback. The Pariahs are a great example here. The Pariahs were a group of young people whose parents met up on Dire Island, a former hub of entity activity, and all became orphaned when the parents were taken away by the Black Veil and the entity. Felix and Elodie were two of these young people, but we know the group numbered at least five people, so that's three Pariahs at minimum unaccounted for in the story. We haven't had a new Pariah since Elodie three years ago, but there's every chance a future survivor or even killer will fill out that number, so I think it's worth watching out for. For what it's worth, the parents themselves are part of a group called the Imperiati, who are meant to be this anti-Black Veil organisation who've pretty much gone silent since Elodie's Law. Unlike the Pariahs, I doubt the Imperiati are going to come back on their own though, since they only really exist as a footnote to the Pariah stories, and if they're going to get featured at all, it's going to be as a background to the Pariah stories, in the same way that they're just a background figure in Elodie and Felix's Law. Unlike the Black Veil, who have their sticky fingerprints all over history, the only thing we've seen the Imperiati do is disappear, so I think it's safe to say that after three years, they're probably about to take centre stage. That's say nothing of the possibilities of minor characters who already exist, like Saku, the Mad Designer, or Otto Stamper, taking a more central role in events, or the return of older, missing characters like Vigo, the Observer, or even Benedict Baker. DBD is a seven year old game now, and it's had plenty of characters and ideas that it's left to reuse later. But I have no expectations for any of them, really, so I guess we'll wait and see. So far, we've had one major lore event where the entity's nature has been more thoroughly explored the Hallowed Blight, the former annual Halloween event for DBD, which documents a time in which the entity's growths blossom into strange orange flowers called pustular flowers. These flowers secrete a special serum that has otherworldly properties and it's implied that it's this pustular serum that allowed both Vigo and Talbot to escape the void, possibly even allowing Vigo to escape the realm itself. Talbot attempted to replicate Vigo's formula with his creation of Compound 34, a concoction that ultimately turned him into the Blight, but his experimentation continues to this day as the serum is tested on more and more residents of the Fog. Where we should be looking for seasonal event storytelling has changed since the Eternal Blight back in 2020. Instead, there are two places where more entity-related storytelling is being potentially progressed through events. The Void Machines that we see in the annual Halloween event Haunted by Daylight that took over from the Hallowed Blight, and Jezebel, the mad designer responsible for the Twisted Masquerade events we see every anniversary. For this current Halloween event and the last one, survivors have harvested Void energy from generators as giant Void holes have been carved into the realms themselves, but the actual impact of that narratively is unknown. Maybe we'll see more on the event tome this year, but for now I think our best bet for a new Blackstar progression of the Entity's story will probably be found in The Mad Designer. Jezebel, as she's known, has appeared in several tome stories so far as the person who organised the masquerade. Has everybody wished the Sweet Darkness, which I'm assuming is the Entity, a happy birthday every year, and may well have been behind the observed disappearance, which would make sense since he seemed to vanish in the middle of a party. We even know that Behaviour has some semblance of what she'd look like, since she's the one holding Dwight's mask in the key art for the Twisted Masquerade. So if we're going to get more Entity lore explored with the release of a new killer in the vein of what the Blight did, I suspect the Mad Designer will have something to do with it. I'm not making any promises, mind you, this is purely an educated guess, but I'd say keep an eye open for the anniversary in summer 2024, because if I'm right, then we'll be playing witness to whatever plans the Entity and Jezebel have in store for us then. The Entity is the being in the centre of Dead by Daylight's grim and grisly multiverse. Its influence felt in every dark corner of every world where fear of the unknown is allowed to fester. It is literally the stuff of nightmares, a dark mirror of the human race that will exist as long as we do, siphoning lives away into its deadly gains and wringing them of their souls before discarding them when they had nothing left to give. And it's not even evil, not any more than the human race is, because its predation on our mundane fears and urges is all it truly knows. It's a force of nature. A force of our nature. And while individuals might endure or escape it, those people can easily be replaced. And the shadow that it casts over the lives of the few who make it out will never truly go away. Death is not an escape, but even outside the fog, life after the entity doesn't make you any more free. Well, I hope you people really like my video on The Entity, it's definitely been a long time coming. October's going to be a busy month for me in large part because I'm actually returning to streaming again. Yes, I've got my upload speed above 6 meg per second, so now I can actually stream again. I'll hopefully be doing so quite a bit this week because the new Skull Merchant rework is going to come out and I have a lot of gameplay of her to do, so I hope to maybe see you there? 
Link to my Twitch is in the description, and while you're down there, do feel free to subscribe if you're a newcomer to the channel. And you want to see more talk about Dead by Daylight's lore, and quite a lot more than that. Looks like Oni and Feng Min are getting new tome stories in the mid-chapter, so that's what I'll be covering in the coming weeks. But before I go, I've got to say one last thank you to my wonderful patrons make all as possible. They got to see this video a day early, so if that interests you at all, then do take a look in the description, check out your Patreon, to get days early access and a bunch of other sweet perks, so that's right there, waiting for you if you want it. And I guess on that note, I'll see you on the other side. Tata for now.